and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts sang, Come and see, and I saw, and behold, a pale horse, and the rider that sat upon him was death, and hell followed with him. Johnny Masterson threw open the window and inhaled deeply as if trying to rid himself of the smells that seemed to saturate his skin. The three men had been locked in this room for the past 24 hours. They had not eaten or slept, but they kept their long vigil as they fought the old battle of good over evil. Breathing deeply, Johnny tried to ignore the screams and guttural laughter that emanated from the thing they had tied to the bed the thing that had once been a small child. Drawing himself back inside, he collapsed into his chair, his senses immediately assaulted by the smell of piss, shit, and vomit. The thing on the bed, sensing his discomfort, chuckled slyly and wagged its cracked and blackened tongue at him before turning its attention back to the two priests who sat at either side, muttering in bastard Latin as they read the rite of exorcism over and over again. Johnny looked away, out of the window at St. Peter's Square, what was left of it anyway. He had seen the rites of exorcism a thousand times before. It was the priest's time now. When his time came around, there would be no need for words. Not in any language. For a moment, he closed his eyes, trying to remember the square as it had once been, with its rearing columns, marble statues, and ornate, trickling fountains, but even with his eyes closed, he could still see the hundreds of tents, shacks, and rusting caravans that now filled this holy place. It had become a kind of squalid shanty town. The last vestige of mankind cowered as the denizens of hell stalked the earth. All of Vatican City was the same. From the English gardens to the Pignan courtyard, every inch of spare land was covered in a sea of tents and leaning hovels. Disease and starvation was the order of the day. Only the Swiss Guard and, to a lesser degree, the Gendarmerie, also known as the Vatican City Police, maintained order, ruling over the desperate and lawless with an iron fist. Thieves and lawbreakers were flogged, rapists and murderers banished into the Dark Zone, also known as Demon Land, there to be possessed, eaten, or fucked, depending on whatever abomination found you first. Johnny! He jerked awake in his chair, his hands going to his eyes. Falling asleep on the job. You're getting old, Johnny. The thing on the bed crooned. I need you awake. Wouldn't want you to miss the best bits. The thing turned towards the younger of the two priests, who was knelt by the bed, praying frantically, great beads of sweat running down his brow as he read from the Bible clutched tightly in his hands, only stopping now and again to flick holy water at the creature that they had tied to the bed. As Johnny watched... His face impassive, the creature wrenched itself forward, straining at its bonds. It vomited noisily all over the priest's hands, Bible and all. With a cry of disgust, the younger man jumped to his feet, dropping the holy book to the floor and wiping his soiled hands up and down his cassock, his mouth working silently. The creature on the bed chuckled grotesquely before settling back down on the filth-covered sheets, turning its attention to the older priest by its side. Is this the best you can do, Father James? Is this your so-called apprentice? Where did you find this one? Probably in some farm fucking pigs. Looks like a pig fucker, wouldn't you say, Johnny? It said slyly, glancing over at the grim-faced man by the window. Do not speak to the creature, the old man commanded. Technically, Johnny was under the command of the priesthood but chose to ignore the other man anyway. I think they all look alike to me. For a moment. The creature gaped at him before bursting into deep, choked laughter. That's a good one, Johnny. I like that they do all look the same. You all look like meat to me. You know that boy can't banish me, it said, 
nodding with contempt at the younger priest who had retreated to the old man's side as if seeking comfort. I will ascend, Johnny. I will break these bonds and kill you all! Johnny shook his head sadly. You know I won't let that happen. You must kill this vessel. Kill this young child to stop me. But you don't mind that, do you, Johnny? How many have you killed now? Murdered? How many men, women, and little children have you slaughtered in the name of your sheep god? How many? It strained at its bonds causing the bed to vibrate as it twisted and jerked, desperate to be free, to be let loose upon this hateful men. I've murdered no one, Johnny said, raising to his feet and pulling a silvered stiletto from the sheath of his belt. You did the killing. It was you and all your bastard kind that caused their deaths. There is a place for you in hell, Johnny, the thing spat as he approached. A special place for child killers like you. You're going to burn. You're going to burn in the fires of hell forever. Get away from me! It drew back into the bed, pinning itself against the headboard. Fuck off, you pig fucker child killer! I'll tear out your motherfucking soul! Johnny ignored the creature and took out a wooden crucifix from under his shirt. Far from grace have you fallen, O child of perdition. In the name of God, I smite thee, and I send you back to hell from whence you came. Fuck you! No, Johnny said, smiling. Fuck you. With practiced piston of his arm, he thrust the blessed silver forward, driving it upwards under the creature's chin and through the roof of its mouth and piercing the brain within. The creature jerked, its entire body going rigid, its eyes widening in shock and surprise. Then it slumped back down to the bed and lay still. All that remained was the wasted body of a tiny child. All evil fled. Johnny wiped off his knife and pulled the covers over the tiny figure. He made the sign of the cross. And then slowly walked away. He had been back in the barracks less than an hour, just enough to change his sodden clothes, have a shower, and grab a bite to eat when the priest walked in. The man was tall and lean with a hawk-like nose. His vestments hung on his skinny frame as he walked over to Johnny's table. The most ho holy father wishes to see you, the man stammered, looking down at his feet. Johnny nodded and rose, not bothering to introduce himself. The man obviously knew who he was and Johnny didn't bother to learn the names of the men who served in the priesthood. New priests were indoctrinated into the faith every day from the nameless masses. They did not survive very long, but the temptation of three square meals a day in a warm bed was just too much for some people to resist. Either way, Johnny said, snapping on his gun. Tell me where his holiness is today. Where he always is. The other man replied, tugging uncomfortably at the white collar around his neck. How long? Johnny asked, looking the other man up and down, taking in his unshaven face and dirty fingernails. How long what? The priest said, finally looking Johnny in the face before quickly looking away. Johnny didn't mind. He was used to having this effect on people. His face was a mess of scars. How long have you been a priest? Two weeks. You're already running errands for his holiness. Tell me, have you seen him yet? Yes, the young priest replied, a look of adoration lighting up his face. I saw him this very day, standing by the fire of our most holy father, Raphael. I fell to my knees before his most holy light. You would have loved that. I was in the presence of an angel, a, a real life angel. Johnny was not surprised to see tears streaming openly down the other man's face, or the look of blind exaltation stamped across his rough features. He spoke to me. He told me that I was the beloved of God. Yeah. They do that sometimes, Johnny replied, pushing past. You better get going. 
We wouldn't want to keep Ralph waiting, would we? Ralph? Never mind, Johnny said, as they emerged into the light. It was summer now, and the days were long and hot. You said His Holiness was in the Sistine Chapel. Yes, uh, with Raphael, the priest said, falling in beside him as they entered St. Peter's Square. Yes, you mentioned him, Johnny said as he tried to navigate his way past flapping tents, rusting lean-tos, and smoldering garbage. He sometimes wondered how the entire place didn't go up in flames. There! Someone shouted as they passed. Johnny whirled his hand, dropping the butt of his gun. There they are! A man had separated himself from the milling throng. Now he staggered forward, a gray skeleton with a long, shaggy beard, and grabbed at the startled priest. Alms! He begged. Alms for the poor! I have nothing. The priest said, wrenching himself free, a look of distaste flashing across his face as he straightened his cassock with quick, angry jerks. The morning rations have already been issued. You'll eat again this evening when the evening rations are dispensed. Eat? What did you eat for breakfast, priest? I had a handful of berries and a crust of stale bread. The other people had started to gather now, angry grumbles of agreement rippling through the crowd. And look at this killer, he said, turning to Johnny taking in his massive frame. Johnny said nothing but just stood there, a rock against an encroaching tide of trouble. Leave now, the priest commanded. It is not for you to question the servants of God. The servants of God, the man howled. The light of madness danced behind his eyes. Shit, Johnny whispered, knowing what was coming. As the man tensed, ready to leap, he drew his gun ready to protect the foolish priest. But he needn't have bothered. Before the man could even say another word, a chainmail-clad arm wrapped itself around the old man's neck and threw him to the ground. The crowd let out a frightened yell and scattered as a platoon of Swiss guard marched through, trampling makeshift homes and ripping through tents. Their gleaming halberts lowered. Any protest was met with violence, until only Johnny, the priest, and the groaning man on the ground remained. The captain gave a quick signal and his men broke ranks, forming a protective circle around the three men. What's going on here? He demanded, addressing the priest. This man assaulted me. Did he now? The captain said, towing the man's side with a booted foot. You know, it's a death sentence to harm a priest, old man. This man is crazy, Johnny said, holstering his weapon. Half mad with hunger. The old fool meant no harm. They are all hungry, that they do not all assault the priesthood. Priesthood, <laughs> Johnny laughed. Look at this one. He has only been off the farm a couple of weeks. Regardless, the captain went on, lowering his sword until it hovered just above the old man's throat. He is a priest indoctrinated into the most holy Roman Catholic Church and a member of the priesthood and therefore sacrosanct under the new laws of Vatican City. So, unless Father Michael, the priest said, chest swelling with pride, my name is Father Michael, Captain, and I have no objection whatsoever. If the common rabble believe they can do whatever they like, and to a priest no less, then there will be anarchy and chaos. You may proceed, Captain. Wait, Johnny said. You may not interfere in this matter, the Captain said, eyeing Johnny nervously. Johnny held no rank as such, yet was a special attache to the Pope, allowed into His Holiness's presence any time, night or day. To be honest, not much was known about the man except that he was rumored to dispense mercy to those possessed or overtaken by the minions of hell. Also, it was believed in certain circles that he was a member of the Broken Messiah, a so-called secretive group of exorcists and spies that answered directly to Pope Clement II himself. I said continue, Captain, the scruffy-looking priest said, glaring at Johnny. You will do nothing. Johnny said, grabbing the startled priest by the ear. He dragged him forward, mumbling something into his face from behind clenched teeth before shoving him away. The priest stumbled, nearly falling. Only the captain's arm stopped him from going to the old man on the floor. For a moment, the priest just stood there, his mouth agape. His face had gone deathly white and his hands shook, where he scrambled for his crucifix. You wouldn't dare. Johnny said nothing but just stared at the other man. You wouldn't really do that to another human being. Would I? Let's get one thing clear, priest. I don't make idle threats. We'll let him go. 
the priest said, turning to the captain. <laughs> Quickly now, release him. The captain immediately sheathed his sword before roughly pulling the old man to his feet and pushing him away. What did he say to you, father? The captain said. Did he threaten you? No, not at all. You can go now, captain. In fact, I, I shall go with you. Good idea, Johnny said, smiling at the priest. Go with God, father. The priest said nothing but quickly scurried away, taking his armed escort with him. Johnny smiled, glad to be rid of the man. Too many priests in one day made his teeth itch. He hadn't gone more than a few steps when he spotted Father Matthew, waiting for him on the steps of the basilica. As usual, when he saw his old friend and mentor, a stream of emotions ran through him. The first, and always quickest, to pass was fear. Even now, after nearly thirty years, he still associated this man with fear and pain. He could still remember the first time they met, the steaming chalice, the bubbling silver, his own screams of pain as the cleansing fire purified his soul. Yet overriding these emotions was love. A love so deep it can only be compared to a son's love for his father. And not only had this man saved his life, but also his immortal soul. Johnny still dreamed those times and the training that he had endured at the hands of Father Matthew at the Santa Maria Monastery just outside of Florence. The training itself had been brutal, almost Spartan in its intensity. Johnny had arrived with the coming dawn, just as four other recruits, three boys and one girl, all orphans like himself, were being introduced to their new instructors. Johnny had stepped forward, meaning to join the others, but Father Matthew had gently pulled him back. Not you, Johnny. You're with me, he said, falling to one knee before the boy. I told you once that hate is a seed that grows, and you will come to hate me, boy. But know this. Everything I do is for your own good. To make you stronger for the coming days. To keep you alive and to serve God as best you can. On this, Father Matthew had been wrong. Johnny had not come to hate the grim-faced man, but to despise him. For when the other boys were sleeping, Johnny was running. When they were eating, Johnny was learning the way of the blade and the cleansing fire. When the others were given rest and respite, Johnny was stuck in a dingy classroom, and whenever Johnny got up the nerve to complain, Father Matthew would tell him in his gravelly voice, The mind is a weapon, boy. Perhaps the greatest weapon of all. You must keep it sharp and keen as any blade. And so the lessons had gone on, just like the training, until one day Johnny had looked in the mirror and found himself nearly a full-grown man. It was in his seventeenth year as he lay exhausted on his narrow cot that Father Matthew had entered his room and dropped into a nearby chair, and Johnny, for the first time, noticed how much gray had crept into his mentor's hair over the long years. You are nearly a man now, Johnny, Matthew had said in a surprisingly gentle voice. You are getting stronger, and I older. Tell me, Johnny, how would you like to leave this place and come with me to Rome? At what cost? Johnny had immediately countered. At this, Father Matthew had chuckled. You know me well, Johnny. Yes, I know you well, priest. Feeling sorry for yourself? Father Matthew asked. It's not a luxury I can afford, Johnny replied hotly. You taught me that. I've taught you many things, Father Matthew said, climbing to his feet. Now it's time to put them to practice. What do you mean? You're taking your final test tomorrow, boy, he said over his shoulder as he headed for the door. Pass. Come with me to Rome. Fail. But he never finished his sentence. Just gently closed the door behind him. The next morning they met up in the monastery courtyard. Father Matthew, leaning heavily against a battered open-top jeep. You got my bags, I see, he said, noting a large duffel bag swinging by Johnny's side. Yeah, I got it, Johnny said, dumping it unceremoniously into the back of the jeep. Well, that's good. Now climb on in, boy. We're going for a ride. Johnny did just that squeezing his already massive bulk into the narrow seat. Father Matthew followed suit, trying his best to accommodate Johnny's large shoulders. Damn, boy, he chuckled. 
how you've grown. Next time, I'll bring a tank. I'm not a boy. Jenny glared at him. Yes, you are, Matthew replied, his gaze unwavering. Until I tell you different, that's exactly what you are. Johnny dropped his eyes under Matthew's steely gaze and stared sullenly out the window. Matthew said nothing more but dropped the jeep into gear and sped out of the courtyard, leaving a trail of dust behind him. It was nearly an hour later, as the jeep was speeding up the winding mountain road, that the two men began to speak again. So where are we going? Johnny finally asked. Il Posto Alto, Father Matthew replied, never taking his eyes off the road. The high place, Johnny translated. It's a small village up in the mountains, Father Matthew said, glancing at Johnny out of the corner of his eye. Yeah, I remember the place. You took me there once on my 11th birthday. Rare treat. It was your 12th, Matthew said, turning off the main road and onto the bumpy side road. The leaning trees forming a kind of tunnel, shadowing the men's face with broken sunlight. They said nothing more, both lost in their own thoughts until at last, Father Matthew pulled in a weed-strown parking lot. He turned off the ticking engine and casually lit up a cigarette. So what now? Johnny asked, growing restless. Now you take your final test. This is a hunt, Johnny. Something's plaguing this place, and it's up to you to find it and kill it. Simplicity itself. If Johnny was surprised, he didn't show it. Let's get to the graveyard, then. I believe it's at the other end of the village. It's rather large for such a small place. Why is that? Matthew asked, his eyes narrowing suspiciously. Because that's where the ghouls will be, Johnny grinned at him. And how in the hell do you know we're here to hunt ghouls? Matthew asked, crushing out his cigarette angrily. Simplicity itself, Johnny said, his smile growing wider. I looked in the duffel bag you sent me to fetch. I never told you to do that. You never told me not to, either. You simply said, fetch me the bag. For a minute, Father Matthew's face turned an alarming shade of red. And then his shoulders sagged, and much to Johnny's relief, he began to laugh. <laughs> Adapt and overcome, eh, Johnny? So tell me, what did you see in the bag that makes you believe we're hunting ghouls? Okay, Johnny said, taking a deep breath. There's no holy objects in the bag. That counts out demons and vampires. Also, no silver ammo, so that counts out lycanthropes. The ammo I did find is a mixture of pyro and explosive, which means that if we're fighting is very susceptible to fire. There's also a stab vest, and ghouls are known for their sharp claws, and the most telling of all, the rotting human arm that you have vacuum packed in there. I won't ask where you got that from. Father Matthew smiled, pleased with his apprentice's cunning and sharp mind. Very good, he said, climbing out of the car. Now all you have to do is kill him. Them, Johnny said, scrambling after him. Of course, Matthew said. Ghouls hunt in packs, Johnny. You know that. How many? Johnny asked, grabbing up his equipment. Four, maybe five. Well, that's what the villagers told us before we evacuated them. Guess you'll find out tonight. Great, Johnny said, following Matthew into the deserted village. That's just... <sighs> Great. That night, Johnny stood in the graveyard. A full moon sailing overhead, casting crawling shadows amongst the leaning tombstones. Father Matthew stood outside the cemetery gates, smoking and watching Johnny very closely as he laid down the bait. Johnny knew the smell of rotting flesh would drag the ghouls out of hiding. They were scavengers by nature. They would attack a grown man if they came up on him alone, bleeding or gravely injured, but they were cowardly by nature. Still, it was a brave man that stood between them and a meal once a feeding frenzy had been triggered. That's what Johnny was doing, standing right between them and their food. The first creature seemingly materialized out of nowhere. One minute, Johnny was scanning the shadows trying to look everywhere at once. The next thing, the creature was just there, hunched atop a leaning tombstone, its feral eyes awash with moonlight as it scented the night air, almost like a wolf. Johnny cursed quietly under his breath. 
and slowly unslung his rifle, never taking his eyes off the creature before him. He had only ever seen its kind rendered in pictures and rough sketches, but they paled in comparison to the real thing. The creature was mainly manlike in regards that it had two arms and two legs, but that's where any resemblance to man abruptly stopped. It was impossibly thin, its hide a muddy brown color and tough looking like old leather. The neck was long and corded with muscle to support a large bald head made up mostly of eyes and teeth. The creature was on the move now. Slinking through all the tall grass towards him, Johnny raised the rifle and the creature immediately froze, whining and snarling at him. Suddenly, there was a rustling from Johnny's left, and another creature crawled its way out of the shadows. From his right came a gurgling howl, and another of the creatures appeared, white foam dripping from its chomping jaws. From above him came the rustling of leaves. Johnny's head shot upward, just in time to see a large shadow detach itself from an overhanging branch. With a cry, he thrust his rifle upward, peppering the fallen creature with hot lead. The explosive rounds tore great chunks out of its loathsome hide and set its writhing flesh on fire as it fell dead at its feet. He screamed out as hooked claws pierced his flesh, dragging his legs from under him. Johnny fought against the pain as the creature tore into him. Sighting the rifle down the length of his body, he pulled the trigger, shattering the creature's head in an explosion of bone and blood. Another creature came bounding in. Just as Johnny staggered to his knees, it leapt for him. Johnny let out a cry and threw himself back down. He rolled to his left just as the creature sailed overhead before leaping to his feet, his wounds almost completely forgotten as adrenaline flooded through his system. The creature landed hard and spun around, hissing wildly as razor-like claws slashed into Johnny's back. Without ever turning, he thrust the butt of his rifle backward, hearing the satisfying crunch of bone. He didn't bother to look, but opened up on the snarling creature in front of him, his muzzle flashes lighting up the night sky as the hellfire rounds did their grisly work. The gun clicked empty just as Johnny spun around, desperately scrambling for another magazine, but it was too late. The slobbering ghoul rammed into him, smashing him down to the ground and stealing his breath as it screamed and triumphed. Its head lunged towards his unprotected neck. He just managed to get the now empty rifle between them, ramming it into the ghoul's gaping mouth, thrusting it backwards. Out of an act of sheer desperation, he lunged forward, sinking his teeth into the creature's vile flesh, tearing at its throat. Viscous blood filled his mouth, pouring over his clenched jaw, spilling down his chin, soaking his shirt. Howling in pain, the creature shook free, falling backwards, skeletal-like hands covering over its ruined throat. You bastard hellbound fuck, Johnny grated, scooping up his rifle and advancing on the fallen ghoul. You're going straight back to hell. He brought the butt of the rifle, whistling down over and over again, pulverizing the creature's head, cracking its skull, until only a red ruin remained when strong hands grabbed him. It's over, Johnny, Father Matthew screamed into his ear. It's dead. It's dead, Johnny. They're all dead. Johnny stopped his wild swing and looked at Matthew, as if seeing him for the first time. Five, he said breaking free of the other man's grip and desperately looking around the graveyard. The villagers said there were five of them. Smiling, Matthew raised a bloody machete from his side. I don't think it'll be bothering you, Johnny. Johnny grinned then. I thought you weren't allowed to help. Father Matthew smiled innocently. It was self-defense, Johnny. Thing was coming right for me. Right. Johnny winced in pain at his back. It jumped right over the graveyard fence to get at you. Again, Matthew shrugged. Maybe it saw the size of you and decided I was an easier target. But you showed it different. Either way, thank God you were there. I've always been there for you, Johnny. I always will be. They come with me, he said, supporting the younger man as they limped out of the graveyard. Let's get you patched up and off to Rome. Johnny stopped and looked the other man in the eye. What is it, Matthew? What will I learn there? The truth, my son, Matthew said sadly. God help us all. The truth. Johnny searched the man's eyes, but said no more. Exhausted and bloody, both men staggered to the waiting dawn. Johnny, you with us? 
Johnny gave himself a mental shake, dragging himself back from the past as he reached for Father Matthew's outstretched hand. Seem far away, boy. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about... the past. And why in God's name would you want to do that? Father Matthew said, gazing over the sea of tents. All it's done is lead us to this place. Yeah, Johnny said, following the other man's gaze. You think we ever had a chance to stop it? No. One can't stand against prophecy. All foretold in the book of Revelation. So we never stood a chance. All that blood spilled for nothing. No, Matthew said, gently clasping Johnny's arm. Not for nothing. Could not hold back the tide, but we did delay it. Delay it long enough for Mother Church to prepare herself. And if it wasn't for us, many of these people here today would be dead by now. Their tormented souls condemned to hell's fires for all eternity. Come now, he said, gently guiding Johnny up the marble stairs. Forget the past. It's done. Only exists in the minds of men. For now, you must look to the future. And right now, His Holiness wishes to see you. He wishes to see me or his winged friend. Does it matter? These days, they're one and the same. And that's the problem, Johnny said, pulling up short before the doors of the Basilica. I take my orders from his holiness alone. No one else. <laughs> Dear God, Matthew laughed. Only you could be suspicious of an angel, Johnny. I don't like them. I trust their motives even less. We're nothing to them. Chess pieces to be moved around, manipulated at will. They saved us, Johnny, Matthew said, the first hint of anger creeping over his voice. If it wasn't for them, we'd all be dead. We are dead. Millions of us. We're on the brink of extinction, Matthew. They did what they could. For 666 days, they fought against the hordes of hell. Yeah. With mankind crushed in the middle, a moth between two burning flames, all of humanity, no more than collateral fucking damage, and in the end, for what? Neither side won. They fought themselves to a bloody stalemate, then retreated to lick their wounds, leaving the world in ruins where the ghosts of humanity live out the rest of their lives in this pointless purgatory. You really believe that? Matthew said, his anger melting away at the despair in Johnny's voice. That there is no point. That God has no more plans for us. God! Johnny laughed, pushing through the doors and entering the basilica. Where is he, Matthew? Answer me that. We know he exists. Maybe, maybe he doesn't care anymore. Perhaps he stopped giving a shit about us when we nailed his only son to a tree. Perhaps. Matthew sighed as they stopped just outside the entrance to the chapel. But you're about to talk to the closest thing we have to him. Try and show some respect. Of course, Johnny said, smiling sadly. And never mind me, Matthew. You know I always get melancholy after an exorcism, especially, especially one that goes so spectacularly wrong. I know. I know that, Johnny, Matthew said, laying a gentle hand on the younger man's shoulder. Even as a child, you always had a big heart. It's both your greatest strength and your greatest weakness. Go on, then. Best not keep him waiting. Go with God, Johnny, he said, making the sign of the cross. Yeah, you too, Johnny said. But his face was troubled as he watched the old man walk away. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. I really appreciate it, and anytime you guys give me a subscribe or a follow or a like or a comment or literally just a watch, I can't thank you enough for it because you're the reason I keep making episodes and you guys are the reason that I love horror as much as I do. We're in the middle of summer. 
and I'm from Texas, which means that it's a great time for iced tea. And you know who makes iced tea? My wife. My wife sells tea. My wife sells tea on etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. If you want to get the Mr. Creepy Pasta special, you can order a dark and stormy night and specifically request a dabbing sticker that you only get if you ask for it. And as always, I want to give a very special thanks to all of my patrons at patreon.com slash Mr. Creepy Pasta because you guys are the reasons I get to keep my lights on in the house and get wonderful little treats for my cats and everything like that. And also the reason why we keep getting special custom series just for the channel. So a special thanks to Jacob Schaefer, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Arst, Ken Lando Higuchi, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Bardo Hawk 764, Banana Mafia 1, Melancholy Corpse, Hollow Zero, Ferb, Harley, Billy Morrow, Katie Birch, Sashi Sasaku, Caden the Spooky Boy, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Faye Lockett, Miss Xandra, Mr. Unsettling Spaghetti, Eurogore, Suji Campbell, Marco Takes Dabs 420, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Robert White, Andres Garcia, Snails Brennan, Legit Quad Feed, James Bruce, Chris Lovins, Freddy Krueger, Tynan, Justin Johnson, Michael Scarborough, Infernal One, James Lowe, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Someone You Love, Kira the Sloth, Tommy Green, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, Corey Kenshin, and Peaceful Buddha. That's right, guys, at patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, you could join this amazing list of people's names I mispronounce and the list of Patreons down there in the description. But of course, none of that is ever required. I just appreciate you guys subscribing and watching and honestly being here. So, to all of you, sweet dreams. <laughs>